Hi everyone, my name's Emily Thiebri. I'm also known as Ranger M. I'm an environmental educator and communicator and I get to talk to a lot of different people about all things nature and conservation. I love to knowledge share and that's what I want to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Ontario is a beautiful place to live. We have many different ecoregions, ecosystems, and wildlife. We have bears, moose, and everything in between. But we also have four beautiful Great Lakes. Today we're going to speak with Dr. Katie Stamler, a water quality scientist from Essex Region Conservation Authority. She's also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Windsor. We're going to speak about all things Great Lakes, water quality, and even algae blooms. So come on, let's go meet up with Katie. The Great Lakes account for how much of the world's fresh water? A, 10%, B, 15%, C, 20%, or D, 25%. The Great Lakes account for how much of the world's fresh water? A, 10%, B, 15%, C, 20%, or D, 25%. Approximately 20% of all the world's fresh water is in the Great Lakes. Half of that is found in Lake Superior. Hi Katie, thanks for joining us today. Sometimes I forget how far away Windsor is, so thanks for tuning in for, uh, through Zoom today. Awesome. I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself and your role with Essex Region Conservation Authority. Sure, I'm Katie Stamler. I'm the Water Quality Scientist and the Source Water Protection Project Manager at the Essex Region Conservation Authority. So my job at the Conservation Authority is really managing all of our water-related programs. So we do research and monitoring uh, through source water. I develop policies to help us protect our sources of drinking water. So before they ever even get into the water treatment plant, protecting those, those sources from um, contamination. Um, I have a PhD in aquatic ecology. So I did, uh, I went to university at the University of Windsor, the University of Guelph, and uh, Western University in London. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Windsor through the Great Lakes Institute of Environmental Research, and that allows me to be a committee member on student projects, so still get involved with the research side of things um, and have that exposure to the enthusiasm that graduate students bring to, to the table. So it helps to keep me engaged and active and, um, and excited about the work that's going on. Wow, that's awesome. You must have a lot of passion uh, for the Great Lakes and our water sources then. I really do. Yeah. Since we're talking about the Great Lakes today, I was wondering if you could just give us a bit of a history. It's pretty cool we have these huge Great Lakes just in our backyards. Uh, but I don't think a lot of us know enough about them, especially where they came from. You know, we take it for granted because we've, you know, we've lived here and especially in Windsor, Essex, people tend to live here, you know, they grow up here, they stay here or they come back here and we're exposed to water. And, and here where I am, I'm surrounded by the Great Lakes. We've got Lake St. Clair to the north, the Detroit River uh, to the west of us, and then Lake Erie to the south of us. So we're used to it. We see it all the time. But when you look at that bigger picture and what we're part of, right, the whole Great Lakes system from Lake Superior through um, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, it's a whole great big system that moves water out through the St. Lawrence Seaway and all the way out to the oceans. Um, and all of this sort of came to pass through our last, you know, glacial period and um, and all of that sort of sort of thing, right? So these Great Lakes have been here for a really long time and, you know, the water stays in that system for a long time. And the thing that I find most important when I'm talking to people is trying to make a connection to the actions that we take personally on the ground and how we connect that to our water. So really looking at what watershed we're part of, I think is really, really important so that you see, you know, when I take an action on my front lawn, what is the body of water that's immediately affected? And then what's downstream of that? So for us, it's Lake Erie is downstream of us, but then there's still Lake Ontario downstream of, of that, right? So knowing that our actions continue to have a downstream impact. There's obviously lots of reasons to keep our lakes protected and safe, not just for our drinking water, but as a uh, habitat, source of food for our wildlife who depend them, on them, uh, our crops that need them to, as sources, uh, and so many more. Uh, but there's a lot of threats facing them today. And uh, one of them is in the, that's getting a lot of attention in the media is algae blooms. 
Katie, for some of us who don't fully understand uh, what this means, can you share what algae blooms are? Yeah, so an algal bloom is basically an overgrowth of algae. So when we think about algae, you know, you maybe you have a fish tank at home and maybe you've seen algae get out of control in your fish tank and then you have to clean it. Um, you know, and in the Great Lakes, the same thing can happen. And it's because of a number of different factors. Um, you know, we need to have a lot of light available. We need to have a lot of nutrients. Uh, and temperature is important. And then what we're facing in Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie is that we have an excess of nutrients. So the nutrients that we're concerned about is uh, phosphorus and secondarily nitrogen. So those are the two foods that feed the algae and algae are photosynthetic organisms, right? So it's like any sort of plant material that needs that. So, uh, so we look at that excess phosphorus that's available. Then the fact that those lakes are shallow and warm. So those are good, um, conditions for algae to grow in, right? So we have all of that added up together. And what we end up with is that every summer we have persistent algal blooms on the south shore of Lake St. Clair and throughout Lake Erie. And uh, what that can do is it can, uh, we have to change our drinking water practices during a harmful algal bloom because those algae that are present can produce a toxin and that toxin is called microcystin. The algae that are blooming are called microcystis. Um, and we have to make sure that uh, that we're filtering out that toxin. And the complicated factor is that the those algae actually release the toxin when they die. So we have to alter how we treat water. We don't want to kill the algae. We want to filter them out. It adds an extra burden for our water treatment operators. However, our water treatment plants are very well capable uh, of handling this. So our treated drinking water at the end of the tap is always safe to drink. What do these algae blooms mean for our wildlife? That's actually still a pretty complicated question that there's folks doing some research on. So, um, you know, we know that there's a recreational impact because the beaches are green and you don't necessarily want to go in it. It can cause skin irritation. Um, and that sort of thing, if it gets ingested by kids, I don't know if you've ever been to a beach with kids, but you think, how does a kid ingest so much water at a beach? And I watched a kid one time pour a bucket of water onto his face and I'm like, oh, that, that's how they do it. <laughs> but the, uh, for wildlife, what we're, what we're still researching is how the toxins accumulate in fish mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so is there a direct impact on the fish in terms of the toxins that they may be ingesting by eating uh, the algae itself? And then when we consume the fish, are there the, the toxins present in the tissue that we're consuming? So that's that's ongoing research that's, that's still pretty new. Um, algae can also cause a reduction in what we call biological oxygen uh, demand. So it's because the, the algae are using the oxygen up. Uh, so you can create uh, situations with lower oxygen. In the central basin of Lake Erie, we have what's called a hypoxic zone. And that's not so much due to the algae overgrowth, but more due to excess uh, nutrients that are in there. So the, the two are sort of related, but but separate. Oh, okay. Just to go back to like how you said about beaches and stuff. So does that mean we should keep our dogs out of the water when there's algae blooms as well? Definitely. A good, I've got a couple of good rules of thumb for when you're, you know, looking at the beach. Um, first of all, you know, we know beaches can become contaminated, uh, you know, with E. coli and other things. So you want to look at the weather that happened 24 to 48 hours ago. So if you had a big rainstorm, you know, 48 hours, 24 hours ago, best idea is to stay out of the water because that stirs things up. The other thing to look at is the color of the water. If the water is very turbid, that means you you might have some of that sediment and some of that stuff that's sort of buried in the sediment dug up, or if the water is green. And if the water appears to be green, the best idea is to, to keep your kids and your pets out of it. And we do see probably the, the biggest factor that that we see is in dogs, right? Because, you know, not a lot of people are sitting there drinking water, but <laughs> dog is going to go mm -hmm. and play in the water and they're going to lap it up. So yeah. they, you know, we have seen dogs get sick from, from playing in the water and it's really hard. I know dogs love to be in the water, but as a good responsible pet owner, then yes, it's, it's a good idea to keep them out if the water is green. The Great Lakes region, when considering both Canada and the United States, is the primary water source for how many people? A, 10 million, B, 100 million, C, 40 million, or D, 75 million.
The Great Lakes region, when considering both Canada and the United States, is the primary water source for how many people? A, 10 million, B, 100 million, C, 40 million, or D, 75 million. The Great Lakes are invaluable as they are a source of drinking water for more than 40 million people in the United States and Canada. Why are we seeing more issues of algae bloom in our Great Lakes than elsewhere in Ontario? Specifically so, Lake Erie, even compared to Lake Superior. So Lake Superior is uh, much, much bigger, deeper, colder. So by its nature, doesn't um, isn't as beneficial for algae to grow there. They did have an algal bloom there a couple of years ago, which was a big alarm bell that you can have an algal bloom in a lake that shouldn't experience that due to its physical properties. So there's now been some focus and attention as to why did that happen in Lake Superior, where we wouldn't expect it. In Lake Erie, as I said, it's warm, it's shallow. We have a history of um, a lot of excess nutrients ending up in Lake Erie because this basin is very populated, right? It's, it's uh, you know, Lake Erie provides drinking water for 11 million people. So that gives you an idea of how many people are living around the area. And every action we take, right, our drinking water plants, our water treatment, our industry, industry, our agriculture adds to those nutrients that end up in the lake. And then you look at the physical factors of Lake Erie. And then we also have legacy phosphorus. Uh, so anything that's tied up within the sediment as well can add to that, um, to that as well. The other thing we are seeing is that there, there are algal blooms in some of our inland northern lakes, and they're seeing it as well in inland lakes in Michigan. Um, and it's and it seems to be sort of in, even in China, right? They're seeing these increase in algal blooms in this specific type of of algae. So there's some really cool folks that are doing research on, you know, what is it about this specific type of algae that seems to be thriving in these conditions? And a lot of it is coming down to climate change, and that this specific species of algae is very a very good generalist. So it's very good at adapting to this changing climate that we're seeing. So it's outcompeting some of the more native um, photosynthetic organisms that we would normally see. So though we get a lot of attention in Lake Erie, the algal blooms are a problem in some of our inland lakes as well. Oh, okay. Well, you actually touched on my next question, which was about climate change and if that's affecting the abundance and the presence of it. So that's truly interesting. The whole idea, like the warmer, wetter, wilder, right, is what we hear about climate change. And um, you know, when we experience those big spring storms and that the, the nutrients that are delivered in the spring, that's what feeds the algae. So the models that come out of um, Ohio, so they have models that uh, predict how severe an algal bloom will be based on how much phosphorus is delivered in the spring. And that is very much dependent on how much rain and how big and intense those rainstorms are. So that's another part of climate change that can have an impact is, is the delivery of the nutrients to the Great Lakes. I know there's a connection of algae blooms and like phosphates and how we're having some runoff from our agricultural fields and fertilizers leaving our crops and going into the water. But as someone who works in stewardship for St. Clair Region Conservation Authority and yourself, uh, I know working with farmers and large landowners is vital in providing cost sharing programs. For different best management practices uh, that keep those fertilizers on our fields, um, like cover crops and stuff like that. Is there anything you wanted to add on in terms of Essex region and your experience with working with farmers? When we look at um, land use, so agriculture is the biggest land use mm -hmm. and they're the biggest user of nutrients. So, you know, when you look at the data, it, you know, the data says that non point source runoff coming from agriculture is the biggest source of nutrients. And what I always think is a really important message to get across is that it's not because the farmers are doing the wrong thing. It's not that farmers are out there using excess nutrients. Um, you know, they don't wanna do that. It costs them money. They don't wanna lose their, their nutrients. So if you think about every single, fa every farmer when they're applying their fertilizer is losing a very small percentage of the fertilizer that they apply to the environment. But when you add that all up, it adds up to something larger. So mm -hmm. what we, you know, what we find with our farmers is that they, they are, you know, they're interested and they want to do the, these actions, right? And, uh, you know, we offer lots of cost share programs. Uh, we do cover crops as well. And the idea behind cover crops is that you keep um, something, you, living plant with roots 
in the ground so that that's using up the phosphorus, but it's also holding back water from running off. So you're stopping that um, collection of sediment off the land and running into the water. Uh, we do crop nutrient plans, so trying to get folks doing more um, soil sampling so that you're putting your nutri your nutrients on at the right rates, promoting that for our stewardship, right rate, right place, right time, right source. Um, and, you know, really those sorts of like tree plantings are super important, riparian vegetation, windbreaks, all of those things really um, add up to uh, to good stewardship practices. In addition to some of the stewardship actions that we do with farmers, uh, the conservation authorities are also partners in some larger programs. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a bunch of us that are partners in the provincial on-farm program, as well as the federal living lab program. And both of those work at bringing scientists together with farmers and doing um, good uh, co-developed science to help us better understand how those stewardship actions are impacting water quality and soil health. You touched on like habitat improvement projects, so wetlands and tree planting, and those things really help uh, filter nutrients and yeah, hold the soil onto the ground. Um, Katie, I was wondering if you could touch on other issues facing our Great Lakes today. So uh, now that we're aware of algae blooms, what else can we prepare ourselves for and, and help protect our Great Lakes? <laughs> There's a document called the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and that is an agreement between Canada and the U.S. that came into being in the 1970s, um, you know, when the state of Lake Erie was was really quite bad. Um, and it was signed into agreement by, you know, the by the president and the prime minister at the time. And the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement undergoes um, updates from time to time. And within that document, there are several different annexes. Uh, that help us look at each of the issues facing the Great Lakes. Uh, so some of those things are algal blooms and nutrients. We also look at chemicals of mutual concern. So those would be um, any emerging or problematic persistent chemicals that exist. And uh, in the U.S., they're looking at things like PFOS, which is um, things that are present in flame retardant. So that is... Um, you know, a chemical that's contaminating their water courses there. We look at uh, discharge from vessels. So that is a route for invasive species, which is another mm. problematic concern. Um, so we try to, you know, make sure that we're not introducing new species uh, from elsewhere. And there's, you know, recently the IJC did their progress on the, um, the Great Lakes report. And the good news coming from that is that we've had a reduction in the rate of introduction of new species, new invading species. So, so that's good news. I mean, we'd rather mm -hmm. there be no invading species, but the way that, you know, human beings work and we travel and we exist between places, we're always going to have some of that um, happening. Habitat loss is a big one mm -hmm. for us. You know, we have a lot of, here in Essex, we tend to have a lot of species at risk. And that's because we're at the extreme southern range of a lot of species and also at the extreme northern range of a lot of species. Mm -hmm. And then we also have intensive land use. So we have a lot of, uh, of habitat loss. So that's, um, you know, really, really something that we try to work on. We have a lot of fish habitat projects in the Detroit River where we're trying to build up some of that pool fish habitat that's happening there. Um, and of course, climate change is a, a big, a big mm -hmm. thing that's a affecting everybody and really hard to tackle, right? And and just the different elements of climate change, looking at lake levels, lake temperatures, um, all of that sort of thing. Yeah, and I just have two more questions for you, Katie. Katie. Sure. Do you think the Great Lakes can overcome the challenges that we've discussed today? That's a big question. It is a big question. And, you know, I mean, I have to say yes, right? I mean, we're, um, the environment is resilient and it will always find a way to move to move forward right and and it's how we adapt to it and how we mitigate our actions that affect the the water around us and the the species that use the water around us so um you know when the, when the IJC look, IJC looks at uh, the progress they look at you know is the condition of the great lakes fair poor good is it improving, degrading, not changing, you know, and, you know, some of our Great Lakes are in less good condition than others, but, you know, they're sort of reaching this kind of steady state in a lot of places, and we know how to improve it in other ways. Mm -hmm. So if we keep going in that direction, then, you know, I think 
you know, we can move forward and we can do a good job for our Great Lakes. Yeah, I, I agree. And I like to think that um, different education opportunities like discussing here today um, definitely helps people learn about not just the Great Lakes, but the issues facing it and how we can help out uh, as individuals. So touching on that, do you have anything to add on how we as individuals can help our Great Lakes? I think really what's important, um, you know, is find the actions that you can do, right? If we, if you try to do everything and if you try to do something really big, you might be disappointed in, in how that goes or how challenging that is. So find yourself some small actions where you can feel success right? Replacing some of your single use items with reusable items. That's a good place to start, right? And then look a little bit broader, look at your own, you know, front lawn and think about those four hour strategies. Do mm -hmm. I need to use fertilizer on my lawn? Do I need to use all these different things? Or can I be a good steward of my own land? Can I plant some native species that are going to bring native pollinators into my garden? You know, and, and really a lot of those small actions really add up to something large. And what I always say to you is, you know, it, those small actions also show our respect to the folks that have to take really big actions like our farmers and our municipalities and our industries. So when we take those little actions, we show respect to the people mm -hmm. that have to make really, really big actions. I like that. And I lied. I have one more question. And I think the most important of them all, what is your favorite Great Lake? Oh, that's a good <laughs> question. I love Lake Erie. I, uh, you know, I grew up here. I didn't connect with Lake Erie as much when I was young as I do now. Um, you know, but I, I love the community around Lake Erie. Um, the, the individuals that work on Lake Erie are passionate about it and they love it. And there's this great international community that works together mm -hmm to help improve it. That said, <laughs> I love, love, love Lake St. Clair and it doesn't get anywhere near as much love as anybody else does. So I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring for Lake St. Clair because it, it is a beautiful little lake. Sometimes not considered a great lake because it's kind of more of a connecting channel, mm. but it has its own uh, unique beauty. It has its own challenges. Um, like I said, we experience harmful algal blooms along the shores of the Essex region in Lake St. Clair that are very localized, so they don't get the same international attention. So it's a toss-up. Okay, well, I'll take that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, it was so good uh, to learn with you today and to hear all the information that you could share with us. Um, like you said, I think growing up, I definitely took these lakes for granted, um, not knowing my impact on them and also not knowing how I can help protect them as well. Uh, so it was great to talk with you and learn with you about the Great Lakes. And thanks so much for joining us today. Awesome, thank you, Emily. Did you know the Great Lakes Basin is home to over 3,500 plant and animal species that are unique to this area and which some are not found anywhere else on Earth? Did you know the Great Lakes Basin is home to over 3,500 plant and animal species that are unique to this area and which some are not found anywhere else on Earth? Thanks for joining me and learning all about our Great Lakes and water quality with Katie. Do you have a favorite Great Lake? Reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and let me know your favorite lake. Until next time, see you in nature.